Good morning. Um, we are going to read chapters 19 and 20 of Forge today. All right, chapter 19, Thursday, December 25th, Christmas, 1777. Um, this is going to be a letter from George Washington to John Bannister. He wrote, to see men without clothes to cover their nakedness, without blankets to lay on, without shoes by which their marches might be traced by the blood from their feet, and at Christmas taking up their winter quarters within a day's march of the enemy, without a house or hut to cover them till they could be built, is a mark of patience and obedience, which in my opinion can scarce be paralleled. We woke Christmas morning to snow as high as my knees with more falling from the sky. After walking two steps from the tent, what was left of Sylvanus's shoes fell apart completely. Now what am I supposed to do? He asked as he fished out the leather scraps. Before anyone could answer, a rattletrap wagon came along the road pulled by a horse that was more bone than flesh. The driver climbed down. You fellows are the last of the New Hampshire, right? I said Sergeant Woodruff. Then this is yours and I can head back to the barn. The driver took two axes and a small cask from his wagon and handed them to Sergeant Woodruff. Can your lads give the wagon a push, he asked. My horse could use the help. The sergeant called to us and we pushed while the poor creature leaned into the harness until finally the wheels moved. We pushed it all the way to the spot where the road sloped downhill and the driver called out his thanks. We walked slowly back to our hut site, passing a score of half-built cabins belonging to the Pennsylvania Regiment. The others studied the walls and remarked on the few framed chimney stacks. My thoughts were centered on that small cask, wondering what treasures lay inside it. Any addition to our tools would help. The sergeant was sitting on a stump, prying open the lid of the cask as we arrived. Please tell me that's filled with nails, sir, Greenlaw said. I hate to disappoint you, lad, the sergeant shook his head woefully. It's only food. Our huzzas shook the snow. We feasted that morning. We each ate a fist-sized piece of pork and enjoyed a soup of dried peas cooked in heavily peppered water. Best of all was the piece of chewy pigskin we had to gnaw on. I knew I would make mine last a full day, at least. After we ate, the news came down the line that the horse that had pulled the supply wagon had died a short ways down the road. It took half the day to remove the harnesses without ruining either the leather or the nag's body. The wagon was finally pushed away by four fellows from the 8th Pennsylvania Regiment. The horse lay where he dropped. The officer's hut had been finished Christmas Eve, so Sergeant Woodruff could now help fell trees for our use. With three fellows chopping, our pace of work increased. By the end of the day, we dragged four logs to our hut site, stripped them of their bark, and laid them one per side as the ground logs of what would be our walls. I'll take, it'll take till summer to finish the poxy thing, Faulkner said. It was hard to argue that. We had supper then, the rest of the pea soup, which amounted to a half a cup for each of one of us. I stuck my piece of pig skin into the bowl for flavor. When I'd licked the bowl clean, the skin went back in my mouth for chewing, but I swallowed it without intending to and missed it sorely. No one wanted to turn in early, for it was Christmas. John's Burn, John Burns disappeared into the dark, when a few fellows from Pennsylvania started to sing carols. Sylvanus too, though he returned in short order carrying a handful of long strands of horse hair. Some of the fellows protested this abuse of the horse's corpse. I just gave the poor beast a haircut of the tail. He sat close to the fire, perched his spectacles at the end of his nose and set to braiding the horse hair. Though if you asked, if, if you was to ask me, I'd say that old horse is waste of good soup meat. Poxy sentimental horse notions of the officers kept us hungry in 58 too. You were in the army then, asked Greenlaw. Sylvanus nodded, his fingers braiding so fast they were a blur. I joined up when we went to war against the French. I learned a few things about fighting, so I signed on again when it was time to fight the British too. Did you fight at Breed's Hill, I asked. Sylvanus snorted, wish I had. I was in the troops who marched to Quebec that year. You think you're hungry now? Ha. We were truly starving at one point. I had just the head of a squirrel left to eat. What did you do? I asked. 
Sylvanus plucked a thread from his cuff and tied off the cord he had braided. We killed one of the dogs, mixed the meat up with the squirrel's head, added some candle wax, and ate the whole thing. I don't believe you, Benny said. If you ever get that hungry, you will. You whelps is always caterwauling about your bellies and how you're about to die. He pulled out the two pieces of his shoe from the bag slung over his shoulder and set them on his foot, then wrapped the cord around the shoe to hold it together. Long as you get gets a smidgen of grub like fire cake or squirrel head every day, you'll last for months. All right, chapter 20. Um, George Washington writing from Valley Forge to Henry Lawrence of the Continental Congress. Dates Thursday, December 25th, Friday, December 26th, 1777. I am now convinced beyond a doubt that unless some great and capital change suddenly takes place, the army must inevitably be reduced to one or the other one of these three things, starve, dissolve, or disperse. I still do not know what woke me in the night, a clumsy footstep at the edge of our kindling pile, perhaps, or a squirrel, for this was before they'd all been hunted. Whatever the cause, my eyes opened and would not shut. I crawled over my grumbling companions and out the tent flap. I was not due to relieve Ebon at guard for another hour or so, but as I was fully awake, it seemed foolish to wait. I loaded up my arms with firewood and made my way down the dark path to the guard post. There was supposed to be a sliver of a moon, but clouds had been thrown across the sky like a heavy quilt. I stepped carefully for the snow hid tree stumps and rocks. Halfway there, I slowed, hearing raised voices and the sounds of a struggle. Who's there, I called. Name yourself. Numbskull, the ghost voice of Isabel in my brain, absent for weeks, scolded me fierce. What if it's a British patrol or a group of des desperate banditti? Think, fool. Before I could twist my ear, I figure ran, a figure ran toward me, breathing heavy. He veered around me and continued in the direction of camp. It sounded like he stumbled in the snow, but then regained his balance and ran on. I waited until the night was again quiet then walked cautiously. I had not taken 10 steps before I was stopped. Halt, the voice called. What's the countersign? Eben? I strained my eyes but could not see anything. Is that you? What's going on? The sign is Windsor, he said. Give me the countersign. I stepped closer to him. It's me, you ninny, Curzon. The sound of a hammer being pulled to full cock, prepared, preparing a musket to fire, froze me in my boots. The countersign, he demanded. Hartford, I shouted. Don't shoot me, Hartford, Hartford, Hartford. He sighed and uncocked his gun. Can't be sh too sure. Help me up, will you? I stepped close enough to see his form sitting in the snow. I shifted the wood to one arm and reached out a hand for him to grasp. Were you attacked, I asked. Is it the British? No, he grabbed my sleeve before I could run back to alert the camp. It's not the British. What's the matter then? We need to build up the fire. He walked in the direction of the guard post without offering any explanation. I waited, then followed several paces behind him, fighting the temptation to push him back into the snow. By the time I reached the post, he was on his knees, blowing on the coals of the near-dead fire. Guards are supposed to guard, I said, not wander in the night and let the fire go out. I picked through the wood for the driest pieces. I could well freeze to death, thanks to you. Apologies, he said. Go back to camp. I'll take your duty. No fellow in his might right, right, right mind would say such a thing. I did not know what to reply, so I fussed with the twigs and blew and blew until the flames caught and kindled the wood. We both leaned toward the fire to warm our hands and faces. I gasped. Evan's left eye was puffy and darkened with blood. His mouth was swollen too and bleeding, as was his nose and the knuckles on his right hand. What happened, I asked. Do you know how to cook a pumpkin, he asked. Hey, um, unfortunately I have to stop there, but uh, make sure you do those high quality jots and I look forward to um, discussing these two chapters. Thanks for listening.